Okay, everyone, uh, we're at 4.30. Um, so as we give a couple of more minutes for uh, the rest of the audience who registered to come in, uh, let me just kind of get the housekeeping rules out of the way. Um, thank you uh, for those of you who are on time uh, for joining us live on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, my name is Ge Yu. I'm the Executive Director of China General Chamber of Commerce, Washington, DC. For those of you who's uh, tuning in for the first time, CGCC is the largest independent, nonpartisan, non-governmental, nonprofit organization representing Chinese enterprises in America. More information about our organization can be found at cgccusa.org. Today's event is a joint effort by several CGCC organizations around the country, including CGCC USA, which is the national organization, uh, the CGCC Foundation, and uh, CGCC Chicago, DC, Houston, LA, and San Francisco. This event is open to the public and on the record. Opinions expressed by me and our panelists do not necessarily represent that of the institutions we work for. So we want to make today's session interactive so the audience is welcome to submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. So uh, try not to mistake that with the chat uh, window. Make sure you put your question in the Q&A function. Okay, with the housekeeping matters out of the way, I want to quickly introduce today's topic and our fabulous panelists. Anti-Asian and Pacific Islander sentiment is on the rise in recent years. It has culminated in violent hate crimes that shook AAPI communities and the country as a whole. Just yesterday, the Senate passed a bill to boost federal and local law enforcement agencies in addressing anti-Asian hate crimes. A month after the Atlanta spa shooting, this is still a timely and critical topic. We have gathered three champions from the AAPI community to discuss the causes, solutions, and preventions of anti-AAPI hate and violence. Um, you can see our panelists' photos and names in the uh, uh, presentation window. I'm not going to read the full bio of our panelists, they will be available on the CGCC event page after the event. Uh, but more importantly, really none of them uh, needs introduction for CGCC's regular audience. Uh, Attorney Karen King is a CGCC returning champion who appeared in our panel on anti-Asian hate crime last year. And besides being a skilled trial lawyer, she has been a strong advocate for Asian American rights as the co-chair of the Pro Bono and Community Service Committee of the Asian American Bar Association of New York. More recently, her organization has put out a new study, which she edited, titled A Rising Tide of Hate and Violence Against Asian Americans in New York During COVID-19, Impact, Causes, Solution. So welcome, Karen. Uh, Mr. Pin Ni is the president of Wanxiang America's, uh, Wanxiang America Corporation, which is one of the most influential organization in the uh, US-China business community. It is not just because of its $4 billion market value, but also its leadership in corporate social responsibility and Mr. Ni's active role in local communities. He is a vice chairman of CGCC USA and a chairman of CGCC Chicago among his many titles and board seats that will take too long to list. So I'm not gonna say them all today. Um, and then uh, Mr. Jung Yang, uh, this is his first appearance on CGCC events, but he's somebody I have admired for a long time. He is the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. It is the leading organization in America that fights for the civil rights and empowerment of Asian Americans through advocacy, education, and litigation. John himself has a long career serving the AAPI communities, which included various leadership positions in the National Asian Pacific Bar Association and the American Bar Association. Welcome to all of you. Karen, since you have recently done a paper on the spiking violence against Asian Americans, I would like to start with you. So people say those who forget history are bound to repeat it. Looking at the recent rights of anti-Asian hate, how much of it is new and how much of it is just a continuation of an ugly undercurrent of our society? Karen. 
Thanks very much, Ka. Um, Certainly the recent wave of anti-Asian violence is something that we had not seen in recent years. There's definitely a tremendous growth and unfortunate growth in the number of incidents uh, that we're seeing around the country. And that is tied with the rise of the pandemic in this country and a lot of the rhetoric um, that was uh, communicated at the beginning of the pandemic, calling it an Asian virus, a China virus, uh, and that sort of thing. So there definitely is a is a cause and effect there, and it is a uh, an unfortunate um, sort of rise in recent times. However, I think it's very important to remember that, as you say, uh, history has seen similar incidents in the past, and American history is uh, filled with. Um, sort of a, a cycle of um, rising tension and economic stress leading to discriminatory events and uh, hateful incidents and violence. Uh, and so we should all remember that uh, as Asians began to um, arrive uh, in, in the country, there were many incidents in the past um, where Asians were targeted. Um, it's starting in the late 1800s, for example, there were many you know, acts, legislation that actually um, targeted Asians, tried to keep them out of the country, uh, tried to keep women out of the Asian women out of the country. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in 1882. Uh, and even in times of um, health crises, when there was a fear that the plague was, was spreading uh, in, in the country, there was definitely scapegoating of Chinese uh, and Chinese Americans um, trying to blame them for that health crisis. And of course, we all know during World War II, uh, the Japanese internment camps, uh, obviously a, a racist uh, act by the government, uh, the killing of Vincent Chen during um, the time when uh, the automobile industry was, was experiencing economic stress. And these are just some of the examples. So while of course, American history has many glorious moments, it also has uh, a number of these sort of shameful moments that we should remember and, and see the current uh, epidemic as part of a cycle and, and try to figure out what the root causes are so that we can try to prevent this going forward. Right, uh, especially for uh, newer immigrants like like myself, you know, I, I kind of uh, you know came to America at the the kind of the middle point of my life, and I have to learn American history uh, all over again. Uh, and uh, you know, as I talk to a lot of my friends uh, who are in similar situation, they felt like, oh, racism has nothing to do with Asians. I was like, well, you obviously haven't heard about the <laughs> the Chinese Exclusion Act. Let me tell you about you know eighteen you know, something years that that's what happened. So um, that's definitely a very important point for all of us to, to remember as we look at this uh, situation from a kind of a, a, a wider uh, society's perspective. Now, John, uh, with Asian Americans advancing justice, you, I would say, unfortunately have a front row seat to many of these uh, heinous acts against the uh, AAPI communities. Um, what do you think are the causes and trends uh, of the rise in hate? Uh, I mean, Karen mentioned COVID-19 and some of the historical trends. Are there any other catalysts? John, you're muted. I think there's two real causes in, in some ways. Number one is, and we could trace it back even more. Number one is COVID-19. Because of COVID-19, there are health concerns, there are uh, economic concerns that are real. And because of that fear, that fear that happens, naturally people want to look for someone to blame or something to blame. Unfortunately, in this current environment, the Asian American population has been made a scapegoat, has been made a target for that fear and been the community that has been blamed for COVID-19. And frankly, the prior administration used language that, that Karen talked about that made that target on our backs of the Asian American community. So that's number one. Number two though is, we do have real geopolitical tensions with the Chinese government. We all know that the United States and the Chinese government right now are in a real state of trying to figure each other out. And historically, as Karen again said, when we've had those tensions, one piece is a backlash against the Asian American community. That happened in World War II, that happened after 9-11, that happened with Vincent Chin, and it's happening now. So I think those are important pieces. But then if we unravel this a little bit more, I would say other stereotypes that we need to be aware of. First is what's called the perpetual foreigner. 
this notion of no matter how long we've been here in this country, whether we were born in this country, people still see Asian Americans as a foreigner, as an other, as a group to be feared. And that creates with it a level of racism, a level of paranoia, a level of fear that, that causes us to be scapegoated. So that's one thing we have to fight against. The second piece is what's called the model minority myth. This notion that Asian Americans are doing well, we don't have any issues from educational standpoint, from uh, economic standpoint, we're doing well. And that's unfortunate because if you scratch beneath the surface, it is certainly true that there are Asian Americans that are doing well. I would venture to say, certainly with the uh, uh, CGCC crowd, many of you are probably doing well. But then if you think about your friends and neighbors, you think about your relatives, uh, and you think about your, our own Chinatown communities, that image starts to look different. If you think about the Southeast Asian community, that image really starts to look different. And so what happens is because people start thinking that Asian Americans do well, it creates, again, this mentality that, oh, these people are people that are, are not to be trusted. These people are people that, that we should be blaming for our own economic maladies, et cetera. So I think those are two of the common combining factors. Last thing I want to say about model minority myth is that that is a myth that is used against us. It's not a compliment by any stretch. It's used against us to put, pit us as a wedge against the African-American community, against the Latino community. This notion that we are the good people of color and that somehow other communities of color, it's their own fault that they're not doing as well. And we need to, we as Asian Americans need to push back against that and say, that's not true. There's a lot of systemic issues that have caused all of our communities to suffer. And don't let us, don't try to use us as a wedge in these types of politics. Right, and that, that's a very important point. And, and sometimes even, even ourselves fall into those kind of uh, stereotypes too. We think, oh, you know, we're Asians, we're all doing well. But no, I mean, the, the victims of the Atlanta spa shooting, uh, you know, those Asian women that, that you know, work, work in spas, they're, they're, they're not like economically well off. They still have to, you know, work really hard jobs in, in the service sector. So uh, the Asian community is, is very rich and, and, and diverse. Uh, rich in terms of characters and, and backgrounds and, and culture, so uh, it's definitely uh, something that we have to we have to bear in mind when we think about this this community. Now, Nizo, as a as a business leader, uh, have you felt the recent rise in anti Asian sentiments? Uh, I would certainly say, you know, racism doesn't only target uh, poor people, only target rich people, or only target you know. Uh, employees, not employers. There's all shapes and forms of, of racism out there. Um, what, what are the, the other forms that uh, you have witnessed or, or uh, experienced that's other than shootings or physical assault? Yeah, uh, I would say clearly, just as Karen was talking about, you know, those uh, COVID situation, plus what John was talking about, the geopolitical. Those two are major fundamental swing <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, adding the fuel to the fire in, ter in terms of uh, anti-Asian, you know, whether it's, uh, it's a hate crime or discrimination or even harassment, right? So from business arena, I would say we shouldn't, you know, really feel that we need to be fear about what's going on. But unfortunately, this is uh, not just the, you know, your economic life. This is your social life. And uh, those is, uh, you know, you should be able to feel that you are, you are at home. And you should be able to feel you're comfortable to be at home. So unfortunately, you know, I mean, there's many, many, many examples. <clears throat> I, I would just say, you know, last year I have a few friends. And... Uh, I'm not against, you know, the rule and the law, which is perfect, fine. But the way that got handled, there's a lot can be discussed. You know, for example, you know, the DOJ China initiative. Uh, frankly speaking, you know, so far, all the cases brought under the China initiative, there was no one espionage case. But under that initiative, many people got a screen which, you know, really is uh, hurting American interest, American competitiveness. 
and the, for sure it's going to hurt the the Asian American community. And uh, as I as I say, you know, example is uh, I, I I knew a few people was on the airplane, got to pull it out, and uh, not much of explanation. Computer took it away, you know. <clears throat> They take away your computer, take away your cell phone, and uh, it caused a lot of, uh, you know, a couple of them were from the university. So, you know, they had to call the university, try to get, you know, university to to give them uh, some sort of affidavit about, you know, the data they got on that computer is fine. It's fine. Nothing wrong with the computer data. But those are creating a lot of fears. Those fears are very unhealthy because uh, it stop the communication, stop people from, uh, you know, cooperate with each other, trying to really build a better community here. So those are the issues that uh, I can see, you know, whether it's a, it's a COVID or whether it's a geopolitical, we just need to be very careful not to overreach. And uh, there's no doubt, you know, those, uh, you know, political issue are, are, are necessary to be dealt with, but overreach will definitely hurt American interests. Right. Uh, one of my uh, favorite quote by any American is a quote by uh, the uh, the the famous journalist um, Edward uh, Edward Murrow. He said that if we dig deep into our history and our doctrines, we're not descendants of fearful man. I think as Americans, we should all remember that, uh, yeah, we're, this country has never benefited from fear. Uh, uh, we, should, we should expel fear of, uh, of, uh, of each other, especially of, of other fellow Americans. Um, and, and, and Karen, uh, something that uh, Mr. Nee mentioned uh, is that, you know, some of the, 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 the uh, kind of a racial injustice is institutionalized. It, it comes from uh, problems with, with uh, uh, government agencies. Now, one of the issues that got exposed by the Atlanta shooting was that, you know, the, the police officer mentioned, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sex addiction motivation rather than racism. Um, I mean, Considering the often uh, objectification and stereotyping of, of, of Asian women, do you think that is a meaningful dichotomy in, in this case? You know, is it like, can you, can you be both sex, can your sexual addiction be informed by your racism? No, no, it's, it's obviously uh, an error on the part of that police officer. And, there's, and it reflects, I think, some of the lack of education or understanding of the nuances with race relations uh, in the country. And I think they are, there are a lot of sort of points where the police and even prosecutors are not appreciating you know, the way in which Asians are stereotyped. And of course, Asians as a, as a whole is also a very diverse, very large group. Um, and the, the individual sort of stereotypes, even within the Asian population can be different and nuanced. Uh, and that's one area where I think government officials and law enforcement are just not appreciating the complexity there. And I think that remark really shows the lack of understanding of when you, talk about it as a sex addiction and say that it had nothing to do with race, but they just all happen to be Asian women. Yeah. Uh, and the idea that Asian women are too tempting for this particular guy that he was motivated to, to try to shoot them, to, to shoot them, to try to avoid um, his addiction, um, it is really just completely forgetting uh, the, the Asian female Sort of stereotype and discrimination that has lasted for the entire history of this country. Mm -hmm. I was mentioning um, the, the Page Act, which came before the Chinese Exclusion Act, and that um, you know stopped Asian women from coming into this country on this idea that they could be prostitutes because they're you know too tempting, and mm -hmm. um, and that was you know e extremely discriminatory, and it was a mixture of race and gender dynamics that informed that particular act and it's you know still here today obviously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so now we have kind of uh, dissected the problem a little bit we looked at the the, the cause and, and the trend i want to kind of uh, 
switch gear a little bit and talk about, you know, what can businesses and the business community do to help the situation? Nizong, before we talk about uh, how the business community can help the Asian Americans uh, being targeted by hate, I want to first ask you, should corporations get involved? <laughs> of course. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question, although, you know, uh, obviously this is a, a community issue, right? So my belief is that the community issue need to be first dealt with at the community level. So clearly business is a very important part of the local community. And uh, actually CDCC, you know, uh, Chicago, we did a survey among all the uh, members and uh, it was very encouraging to see that almost the 90%, in fact, it's 86% of the company feel that we all have responsibility and we all should participate in some way to support this anti-Asian you know, hate crime. And uh, so that is very good. And uh, you know, one of the things, uh, let, let's just be candid, uh, between the uh, Asian American you know, and other groups, one of the disadvantages for Asian American is uh, the way to speak out. And uh, I saw some other survey, you know, uh, about a 62, 63% of uh, an Asian American, they did not want to report those incidents. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, two reasons. One is they are more afraid of the retaliation. And uh, the second one is they worried about uh, unnecessary attention to their family life. So, you know, they tend to just let it go, which is uh, obviously not necessarily good. If we have uh, Asian American life matter, right? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, we are going to have a lot more attention. So I feel, you know, uh, if uh, in general, you know, if uh, Asian American is not quite there yet due to the culture, due to the history, due to whatever the reason, then the business community should take the lead on that. Because uh, you know we have the resources, we have the platform, we have the manpower. So from that point of view, no doubt, you know, I think uh, it is the job at mm -hmm. the day, especially at today. You know, we just don't have other choice. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, following up on that, Nizong, what what is your recommendation to other businesses or business leaders who want to help out uh, the AAPI communities? Uh, what has Wan Xiang down in the past that has been effective in this area? Oh yeah, <clears throat> that, you know, frankly speaking, that a lot of things can be done. And uh, we can look at the uh, other group of uh, people and see what they have done for their, you know, own people. For example, I always say, you know, let's at least make the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I was uh, invited to another group of discussion with uh, a, a senator to talk about uh, what do we think the government should do, mm -hmm. as an example. So, you know, we list out a few things. As, uh, you know, one, we want the Senate to come out to condemn those uh, anti-Asian hate crimes. So that is uh, mostly done, looks like, you know, yesterday's bill was great. Secondly, we want to urge the Senator, you know, to keep supporting those qualified AAPI candidates for public office. Mm -hmm. So that's the second piece we can do. And the third, you know, we obviously ask the senator to contact the OJ to try to urge the elimination of uh, those China initiatives, which it hasn't really done what it is supposed originally, you know, was set up. So there are many things we can do to make those voice. And, uh, you know, the, the business community obviously has more power in terms of, uh, you know, to express their concern because they are the one invest the money in the community. So if they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel safe, they're not gonna do that. So, so their voice can be heard pretty loud. So that's what they need to do to make the voice. The second one, there's many, I could have taken a whole hour to talk about that, but there are many others, you know, for example, we can build our own platform. Like uh, at the CGCC Chicago, we did a survey, we, we issued a press release, you know, there's a many mm -hmm. things we can do to increase those awareness about uh, uh, the issue you need to get done. And mm -hmm. also we can provide the tools. 
And uh, I, I saw other organizations, you know, they, they do this, uh, this uh, language support. Mm. They do this uh, safe zone, uh, 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 you know, they set up a safe zone. They set up, uh, 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 you know, uh, ambassador program. And they reach out to the community, trying to help everyone to make sure, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, the, 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 the older generation, the Asian American in the United States, there is a language barrier here, for mm. example. So there's a lot more we can do. And, that, and also we can do even internally to our own people, right? You know, we can, for example, Chicago had uh, a gathering a few weeks ago. Many of our people went there on Saturday. We encourage everybody to go and uh, get uh, when they're on Saturday and uh, they all made their voice. So, so I, you know, I mean, company has resources. There are those resources, if you use them right, mm -hmm. then you can make, uh, you know, the voice can be more powerful. So absolutely, you know, there's a lot more. I mean, in fact, I would say we're at the very beginning, you know, we have not mm -hmm. done what we should have done and uh, there is a much, much, much a bigger space for us to get involved. Right. No. And and, and it's. Uh, I think in this particular area, I think corporations definitely uh, have a lot of obligation and resources to um, to help out the API community. And John, I would say, in addition to uh, the the different ways that that Nizon listed. Uh, if corporations wants to help out, one of the easiest ways is probably to donate to organizations such as, you know, uh, Asian American Advancing Justice. Um, however, I want to, uh, so, but, you know, uh, make sure everybody, if you are in a position to, to donate, especially at this juncture, definitely go to John's, uh, uh, go to John's organization and, and help out that way. But I want to ask you this, for, for Asian businesses, should we focus on API communities or is it more effective if we look at a broader picture of racism in America and ally with other minorities, uh, uh, other minority communities to address racial inequality as a whole? No, thanks for that question, I appreciate it. I appreciate the shout out. I, you know, I, I mean, the way I think about this is especially for businesses, I really appreciate how Nizong sort of set it out. There's an internal component. One of the things that businesses must do is protect their workers. And so how do you think about protecting your workers? And sort of for many of the businesses represented here, there probably is a high population of Asian Americans that, that are employees here, but I'm sure that your population, your employees run the entire racial spectrum, right? So then what do you think about in terms of making all of your workers feel whole, feel protected, feel part of a community? And so I think there's a couple of components to that. First is, yes, for the Asian American employees, I do think that they need a special space right now because a lot of them are hurting and that's affecting their work. That's affecting the way they can show up at work. So creating some spaces that they could talk about these fears, talk about these issues, and then think about how they could sort of contribute to efforts like the ambassador program that, that Nizon was talking about, contribute to sort of other programs locally that, that can make them help that healing. But then the next step is also to engage in these interracial conversations and think about how we show up for each other. Because the reality is right now, yes, for the Asian American community, we see this racism directed towards us. But if we just take even one small step back, Let's think about Dante Wright. Let's think about Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. Because it really is part of the same racism that all of us are fighting together. Yes, there's a component right now that is Asian American focused, but we can't just focus on that piece. We need to come together to, to fight about that. Because I think, you know, if we're gonna be real about it, Asian Americans have not always been great allies for the African American community. We've had some time, sometimes have had tensions and let's acknowledge that. Let's overcome some of the stereotypes that we have about each other and, and work together. And that does require difficult conversations. And I think starting at the corporate level with, within your own employees is very helpful because these are people that are working next to each other. They are also already have a comfort level of trust level. And so you can have that conversation that's very, very hard to have if you're just meeting a stranger for the first time. 
So I think, so to answer your question directly, yes, absolutely. We have to think about this in a multiracial sense. And then mm-hmm. we do that. It starts to be some of these smaller conversations, some of these different groups that can get together in spaces that we can do that. Right. And, and equality is not a real equality unless everyone is equal, right? Um, so, so Karen, um, I want to ask you a kind of a, a workplace and, and, and career related question. Uh, in pop culture, we keep seeing Asian Americans being portrayed as, as technical workers rather than, uh, <laughs> you know, very rarely in the like, leadership role. I don't know if you're a, a, a Star Trek fan, but in other iterations, I've seen Asian science officers, Asian communications officers, Asian navigation officers, but rarely Asian captains. So this is often reflected in, in real life. How do we change this real life typecasting problem that keeps Asian Americans away from corporate and government leadership? Right, you don't see this problem in China when <laughs> you have leaders and, and people of, of you know, all levels um, yeah, without this sort of racial <laughs> issue, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, a unique, uh, a very American problem, right? Where you have these stereotypes, you have a very diverse population and you have sort of ceilings and um, things that you have to overcome. Um, I, I definitely think there's a long way to go to get more Asians into leadership roles in all sectors, um, business sectors, legal, you know, and, and also public life. And that is just to tie back into what corporations can do. Um, supporting those initiatives to give opportunities to people of different backgrounds and to support the careers of people in order to make them qualified candidates for all of these leadership positions that might become available, whether it's government or um, within the business sectors or in in any of these um, different industries. Um, Money is often a driver of social change. And throughout history, we've seen the economic power as the ultimate one that pushes social change forward. And when corporations do get involved and when they support um, organizations or efforts, when they adopt their own initiatives internally, whether it's hiring or you know, vendor relationships, where they think about social change and social justice in making those decisions, that can have a very powerful effect on um, you know, promoting equality and promoting um, people to, to higher positions down the road. Mm-hmm. John, you, you have actually held presidential nominees of the Asian Heritage past uh, Senate confirmations. Uh, do you agree with Karen on how to increase the uh, uh, Asian pre- uh, presence in corporate and government leadership? I do. I think there's a number of things. And you're right. Certainly at the corporate side, uh, within the administration, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, But then I also think about going back to your question about media, just I I do think that there is starting to be a change. And and then you want to think about that change in what I call a holistic way, in a very large way. On one hand, we do want more Asian American superheroes, if you want, you know, like that Shang-Chi is the the, Mm -hmm. the movie that just came out. I think that is an excellent example of sort of getting out of the typecast of Asian Americans uh, as just being seen as sort of weaker and inferior. But I also want to make sure we lift up stories like Minari because Mm -hmm. Minari is just, it's an Asian American story on one level, you know, yeah, it was cast as a foreign film, but Mm -hmm. it's about a small business trying to establish a farm in Arkansas. (laughs) And that is quintessentially American. Mm -hmm. That involves an Asian, you know, family is unique, but not unique. And if we could celebrate those moments, lift up those moments, right? Mm-hmm. Then start seeing all of us in all of these different things. Because I, I do want to be careful here. So we we want to celebrate the successes, you know, the Jeremy Lins of the world. Mm-hmm. I also don't want to forget that we're also the fabric of some of where the needs are as well. So that's why like the story of Minari, I just think is something that we want to lift up because it's, it shows that yeah, we're not just the, the elite, so to speak. I think that also creates some of these tensions that we see mm-hmm. are part of every segment of the American community. Right. Nizong, at, at Wanxiang, I know you have many Asians in leadership, including yourself. Um, so I'm interested to know, has it been a challenge uh, in reverse like to get non-Asians, uh, you know, including uh, white employees to participate in leadership positions in, at, at Wanxiang. I know 
this may sound like a bizarre question, but but I do know some minority businesses struggle to recruit white workers. Uh, do you have that kind of a challenge? <laughs> uh, not really. Uh, let me let me uh, uh, say this. You know, in a in a Chinese old saying, they call this side of your hand is your skin. This side of the hand is your skin too, right? Mm -hmm. So we call so 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 so. Right. And uh, so from uh, from our point of view, it's very simple. This is a business. And uh, as long as you, you work for one shop, it doesn't matter you work them, you know, in China or in Chicago, in California, in New York, in South Africa, in Europe, as long as you're one shop employee, this is a, this is your home. So, you know, those culture, I think, uh, essentially will create a very healthy environment. So it truly, we can see, it doesn't really matter where you come from. To some extent, you know, I always emphasize, it doesn't even matter what your title is. I never carry a title of CEO. I was the president from day one. I'm still after 30 years, so I'm still the president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we say the title doesn't matter. Your diploma doesn't matter. And uh, what kind of language you speak doesn't matter. And uh, you know where you come from for sure doesn't matter. It all matters. Can you be part of the team? Can you create a value for the customer? It's not just the shareholder. Don't take me wrong. You know there's uh, many stakeholders involved here. First one is your customer. Secondly is your uh, 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 shareholder. Third is uh, the your coworkers, your employee, and the fourth is the community. So you need to balance all those to really create a viable business in the long term. Otherwise, you're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. So from our point of view, you know, uh, for example, we one of the sensitive questions is we always debate what is the language we should use here, right? And uh, obviously, everybody, you know, we're more used to among the Chinese people, we will talk in Chinese. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, we want to be very careful in the way that uh, we want to create a balance you know our official language it should be the english you know so everybody if you're not good in english you should learn you should improve yourself i mean you are here and this is uh this is uh you need to play a role as a local community so you know there are many things as i can see corporation you know especially the chinese company in the united states can do i always say this you know you need to have a root in the soil. Otherwise, any storm, any wind blows, you're gonna be you're gonna be gone. And uh, storm is gonna come. You know whether it's between today, between U.S. China, tomorrow, or something else. You know political way or anything could happen. But if you have the root deep down the earth, which is your community, you know if you are fully connected to the community, then you are a local company. You are a very strong company. I even you know. You probably saw this. I was interviewed by 60 Minutes. One of the questions is, uh, is uh, you know, a Chinese company is such and such. And I say, help me to define Chinese company first. Okay. Is Google a Chinese company, American company? Is Apple a Chinese company, America? I mean, I've used uh, many examples. And uh, so clearly, we don't need to have ideology to, you know, confuse us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to look down, not look up. You know, mm -hmm. look down means that... Uh, what matters is our community. I keep emphasizing that because uh, this is our own job. We don't have anybody. You can, you can, you know. Obviously, we need the government to help us to support. But the community started from us, and uh, that's it. You know, that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's a that's a, that's a very uh, good position to to take and. Uh, uh, you know, the event is recorded. I think I'm pretty confident to say I've never called one young a Chinese company throughout this hour. So <laughs> um, I want to kind of uh, switch gear one more time to kind of talk a little bit about uh, individual best practices. Uh, now, John, you probably know a lot about this particular topic. Can you give us some tips on how to protect ourselves from anti-Asian violence. Give us some uh, uh, street smarts, if you will. <laughs> well, one of the things that we're certainly pushing is what's called bystander intervention training. That, that's something that uh, we, along with a partner called Hollaback, another nonprofit organization, developed 
last year, last April, when we first saw this happening, we did our first uh, virtual training in April or very early April. Since then, we've trained over 70,000 people. And this just gives very basic tips. If you see an act of hate, especially if it, you see it being committed on someone else, what you can do. And there's a couple of very simple things just based on your own personality type. You know, one is you could, it could be as simple as just throw, dropping your keys in front of the two of them. Let's say someone is uh, hurling racial epithets at, at another person. You drop your keys and you say, hey, do these keys belong to any of you? What happens there is it de-escalates the situation. Then people start focusing on you. They forget about what it is that they're, 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 they were sort of what was going on and it becomes a different dynamic. Second thing that you can do is, so that's, that's what you might call distract. Second thing that you might do is called delegate, which is you get someone else to come over, a store manager, if you're on a, you know, on a subway, you know, a, a transit uh, authority to the situation to help manage the situation. You know, so that's, that's what we call delegate. Number three is direct. If you're in a position, and this is not for everyone, but if you are in a position where you feel comfortable telling the aggressor, say, hey, stop that, that's racist. That's obviously very effective, right? Again, we don't wanna put anyone in physical harm's way. So you have to find your own personality type. Number four is just what's called delay. If you're not comfortable intervening at the moment, that's okay. But then after that aggressor has left, right? Make sure just to go up to the victim and say, hey, are you okay? Can I get you to, you know, can I get you to where you need, where you need to go? That small piece of humanity goes a long way because I've talked to so many victims where they just said, I wanted someone to acknowledge what I just went through. Mm -hmm. The fact that no one on that subway said anything was really what hurt them even more than those racial slurs. Mm. The last thing is what's called document. If you're in a position to record it on your phone and report it to a group like mine, that's helpful because then we raise the awareness we know what the data is. The data is never going to be complete, but at least we're in a position to say, these are the types of things that are happening. So that's mm -hmm. nutshell. I could put the post in for people that want to do the training because I, I, I do highly encourage it. Right. So yeah, definitely send us the, the, the link to those information. We'll put that in our, in, in our post event page. Uh, so yeah, those are some very uh, important information. Now, um, uh, John and Karen, both of you have very extensive legal background. Uh, if we do find ourselves being victims or uh, witnesses of, of hate crimes, what should we do legally, uh, Karen first and John? <laughs> well, there are a lot of organizations that can help guide you oh. through a process and you should definitely get help. Uh, help is available. And it doesn't mean getting a lawyer involved means you're going to go full force and you'll definitely be prosecuting and helping uh, to, to push a case. It means just getting some help understanding the process and understanding who you need to talk to, what it will entail, what is the exposure to you from publicity, uh, disclosing your name, the fear of retaliation, I think was mentioned earlier. Uh, and so the Asian American Bar Association certainly offers those services. As you mentioned, I'm co-chair of the pro bono committee. So we definitely mm -hmm. have people ready to help um, anyone that needs it. But there are also many, many organizations that are kind of coordinating on this effort. Uh, and, and you should definitely try to, to contact someone to get that help. Well, I, 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 want, to, I want to kind of uh, just uh, quickly expand on that point just a little bit. Sure. For uh, immigrants who are not familiar with the legal system in the country, what does pro bono work mean? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, pro bono means um, the lawyers that are involved um, in, in the legal context are doing it for free. So you don't mm -hmm. you don't have to pay anything. We're all volunteering because this is this is an important issue, uh, and there are many people that need to get the the legal background and resources uh, explained to them. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we have people that speak you know, most of the languages that I think our communities might need. And if we don't have someone on hand, we can get someone to help translate. Uh, and we will try to walk you through the process so you understand your rights mm -hmm. and you understand what your options are going forward. And if you need help, even if it's medical help or mental health services, we can help put you in contact with the right people. It's a very 
daunting process to to be the victim of a crime and um, having someone there to answer questions and give you basic information, I think, can be a very important part of making it better um, for the victim. Great. John? No, I think those are exactly right. It's don't feel like you're alone. I think that's the biggest thing. They, and uh, go to where you trust, because I, I think Karen's exactly right. There's a lot of different resources that we're all trying to set up. We need to do a better job of outreach to make sure that all of our different com communities know about these resources. Uh, but don't feel like, you know, don't stop and say, oh, well, I don't know. Nothing can be done here, so I'm not going to report it. I'm not going to say anything. I mean, if, even if you're a company, go to your HR person, even if it didn't involve an incident at the company. Because many companies under your insurance program, you, can, you have what's called an employee assistance program where you can get some you know, mental health resources. You get different resources to help the trauma that, 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 that you felt. So uh, what you're hearing me say is, please do something. Obviously, you, know, you could go to Albany, uh, Karen's website, go to our website where you can start. But then also think about your employer. If it, you're at a, a company like Wan, Wan Shang, that, that looks a little bit different. I think that could be a good place to start as well mm -hmm. and go from there. Those are all some uh, very great uh, tips and information. Uh, I want to remind our audience, uh, we do have uh, the uh, Q&A function open. So if you are ready to ask questions, uh, you can ask away in that Q&A box. Uh, Nizong, I want to give the last question to you. Um, what would you say to young Asian Americans today who perhaps grew up in a very pacifist culture, who may be right now struggling with bullying in school or discrimination at work? What is your advice to, to, to young Asians today? Yeah, so I have uh, three kids. <laughs> they all born in Chicago. And uh, clearly, you know, I wanted them to grow with hope, not with hate, you know, I simply just put that in that way. And, uh, but, you know, let, let's just be practical. And, uh, you know, there is a culture and the history for the Asian family that may be, and actually it is a little different from uh, other minority group or other, you know, normal community. So, but, the point is that, uh, you know, uh, for those kids, you know, the future is in their own hand. That's what I would tell my own kid, you know, the future is your own hand. I love what John say about this 5D dimension health, right? You know, mm -hmm. but I, I probably pick another, you know, actually, you know, let me say this. There's a, there's a perception about uh, those uh, anti-Asian uh, crime, you know, uh, 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 elder people, female are more vulnerable to those, uh, you know, uh, uh, harassment or discrimination. But unfortunately, according to the statistics I saw, younger people between 18 to 34, and that's the, you know, as, as younger as the, the survey goes, had the same as the group of 65 and up in terms of, uh, you know, their experience about this uh, anti-Asian uh, 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 hating. So that is a pretty troubling issue, you know, right? You would think, you know, I mean, the, the senior people probably could have due to the language issue or could due to, you know, some misunderstanding or whatever. But for the kids in the school, they need to be able to grow in a, in a, in a much healthy environment. So, but that's on one side. So the other side is to the kid themselves. And uh, I probably, you know, the best is just pick up the AAPI. I learned from John. Use that uh, word, right? The first A, it should be the attitude. Attitude means that, uh, you know, uh, 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 you just have to face it. Don't shy away and, uh, you know, just deal with it. And uh, this is your life. This is your future. And, uh, you know, you should, uh, you should uh, be able to grow with, uh, with the confidence that, uh, you know, it is your country, regardless, right? So, so first is an attitude. 
you, you don't want to shy away, you don't want to hide, you want you don't want to just pull back or hope that this issue will go away by itself. It won't. If you don't stand up, it's going to come with you. If you stand up, you know, again, I use this 5D, <laughs> John was talking, and uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you need a confrontation, but it just means mentally you have to deal with it. So that's the first A. The second A I would call, you know, you need action, right? And uh, uh, there's a, you know, I'm sure school has a lot of different way can help you. So you should have taken action, not just say, okay, I feel bad, you know, I don't like it, but every single incident gave you the opportunity to speak out and to take action. So we should do that. So that's the second one. And the P and I, I would say it's a participation and the involvement. And uh, don't isolate yourself from, uh, from other kids. You know, you are, you are one of them and uh, we should all work together. We should all work together in a way that uh, the, the, the race doesn't even matter. So mm -hmm. participate in the school activity, participate in uh, involve in the school, you know, uh, 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 programs that, uh, and I know the, the Asian students sometimes love to be, for example, in the math competition, right? But that's the, that's the, that's the probably the parents well, at least, you know, I was accused, uh, not accused, but my kids, when they were in the teenager, they were saying, oh, you're just a, you know, a, 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 a Asian parent, right? You want us to study, study, study. And I was joking with them. I say, no, not necessarily me, your president, you know, President Obama won't allow his two kids to have a TV during the weekdays. <laughs> so, but in the meantime, you know, participation and uh, involvement means that you're going to embrace different activities. So you need to jump out of your comfort zone and you don't want people just paying you with one color. And, uh, you know, the leadership, the, you know, the challenge, you know, whatever you can expose yourself, your life should be very colorful. And you should not uh, just put yourself in one box, say, oh, I'm the Asian kid. So this is what I'm going to do. The others don't belong to me. That's completely wrong. So I would say, you know, participation, involvement, Get out of the, the box and uh, be part of the be part of the your your friend's uh, activity. That will make you feel better. So, uh, so now I'm gonna file a patent for the API. I know, right? Did you just come up come up with that on the fly? That was that that was very impressive. As a communications person, I'm always looking for creating like memorable acronyms to. You bad my message in, and that was uh, that was really impressive. <laughs> you yeah. just come up with that. Yeah. That's fine. He helps. Right. It's recorded. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. You have first use. We've we've shown that you have first use yeah. on on the API acronym in this context. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we got some great audience questions now. I think the the first one uh, was touching on what John was saying. Uh, the question was, as an employee, what kind of help can I expect from my company when I encounter racism outside of, uh, of, of work? I, I think probably all three of you uh, could say something about that. Um, and uh, I think, John, since you, you mentioned that first, so why don't you kind of give us your opinion on that? Well, actually, I'd be interested in Nizon, how he would approach it. Uh, right. I was going to yeah. give it to him. Yeah. Once, once. yeah. yeah. Nizon, do you want to take it first? Yeah, uh, I like what, John, you were talking about, uh, you know, a lot of times their frustration is not necessarily the incident itself. It's more about, as you call it on the train, nobody even cares, right? That's the real frustration. If there's one guy, you know, sort of attacking you, but if everybody else say, hey, you know, stop it, guys, you know, this is not right. Now you feel not necessarily you're the hero, but you will feel very warm. So I think, first of all, the company to do is to bring those kind of warmness to the, to the people who experience the bad you know, uh, behavior from the other side. So that is the, whether you call this a counseling or, you know, I, I saw uh, some other company provide those uh, mental health counseling program and so forth and so on. But I would always want to say, let's defend 
our to our own people, you know. So I mean, let's make a strong voice and let's take a, a very rigorous action. If that is something, you know, I mean, attacking our people is attacking the company. That is the bottom line, and that is the line we have to draw. So if uh, you don't think that he's just one guy, this is the company behind it, and that we're going to have to fight. So I think that that is the message. If I, you know, you know, again, if somebody came to my office say that, let, I just say let's uh, let's deal with it. The second part, I would say, you know, we will dedicate the resources, whether this is, uh, you know, uh, 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 money or other, you know, including, as I say, you know, we can always call the local Congress, report to the government, and then we want to show our people we are together with them. And uh, not just by talking, but also by action. And uh, so we will uh, 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 put the financial resources behind it, and we will reach out to the government agency, the law and the uh, you know enforcement team, and to say you know we need to take an action. So I think the company can do a lot, but the key issue is that you need a you know the people spend a lot of time in the office. And in fact, you know, if you take out a sleeping time, they probably spend more time in the office than, not right now, but in the past, they spend more time in the office than at the home. If that's the case, this is their home. If this is their home, if you're the parent, what are you going to do? You're going to have, you're going to have to do what you need to do. So that is, to me, the first reaction you have to have. You know, you got to be angry. You got to take an action. And you got to try to protect your own people's interests. There's no other choice. Otherwise, you're not a company. Great. Um, hey, good. Um, yeah. Given that we're a little short on time, can I just answer some of these quick um, questions? And then Absolutely. maybe Go I ahead. think John wants to, to take on the, the question about uh, minority, talking about minority on minority violence. Right. But just that's, to answer that's, some that's of the, the lightning rounds. <laughs> <laughs> the very quick ones. If you are yeah. a non citizen, you, there, there's no. Um, barrier to you reporting to law enforcement. There's nothing to fear. Your immigration status is has no impact and you can't be um, sort of, uh, you know, at risk for reporting a crime. You also have, you know, the same rights for safety and protection that um, regardless of, of immigration status. So that should not be something that keeps you from reporting. Um, vandalism is a crime. You should definitely report that. Um, uh, Nothing, nothing uh, holding back from that. Um, in general, you know what's most useful for uh, reporting or recording a hate crime. I mean, as John said, you know, safety first, of course. But in terms of documenting evidence, video is very, very useful. Pictures, even recording names, um, if you can figure out who the perpetrator is, and just remembering details about the incident. All of that is very important for uh, trying to put together a case if we're actually going to prosecute the the crime. Um, so John, why don't you take the, uh, the question about how to discuss uh, minority on minority uh, violence? Sure. And actually on the vandalism piece, since I'm a former insurance tort lawyer, definitely <laughs> report it because otherwise you might have problems with your insurance company and getting reimbursement for, for that property damage. <laughs> uh, um, so specifically on minority on minority crime, I, I, this is something that frankly, it's frustrating to me because there are some viral videos that have gone around that show African-Americans attacking Asian-Americans. But if you look at the statistics, that is not the predominant number of attacks that our community is seeing. Our community is being attacked by white Americans still more than any other community of color. Not saying that there aren't other communities of color that are attacking us, but we got to put it in this context because otherwise we fall into that old trap of having communities of color fighting against each other. How do we avoid that? This is where having those interracial conversations within a corporation in different spaces really helps. Uh, I did a, a Washington Post live interview uh, with Sherilyn Eiffel, who was the, uh, the executive director of what, what they call the director general of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, talking about how we build allyship together. What are the common challenges our communities of color are, face? I'm actually doing a similar session with uh, the National Urban League CEO, Mark Morial, next Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, along with Representative Judy Chu. It's important to have these conversations. We are having these conversations at the organizational level, 
but it's important to have them at that family level, at that group level, because we got to dispel these myths or otherwise we're just going to fall into that same trap. Great. Yeah, we, we are uh, coming up to the, the end of our session, and I know uh, Karen has a, a hard stop at, at 530. So uh, I want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, once you leave the meeting, you will be prompted to fill a survey. Please take some time to participate in that survey so we can better serve you in the future. Uh, and on behalf of CGCC, I want to thank all of our audience and panelists again. Uh, thank you so much. I've learned so much today and it's been stimulating and interesting and, and thought provoking all at the same time. And uh, if, if uh, our uh, uh, event runners can throw up our upcoming events, uh, that would be great. Um, throw that up the screen um, so that people can see what we have coming up. Uh, other than that, there it is. Uh, other than that, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.